All right, now we can start. Um, <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, it is so refreshing to see all of you. I know all of you already. And in fact, you're already in your seats, more or less we were last semester. And uh, uh, not only that, but you brought your name tags, which is very nice. Uh, for those of you who didn't, I got more. So um, I know your names, but if you're not in the same space, let's make my life easier. Uh, please. Uh, Pass these around with the markers. Uh, same as last year, just bring this to class every day. You know the drill. Uh, also, the seating charts there and name charts there. Uh, today's actually a very special day for me. I started teaching six years ago today. This is my seventh year, and today's my birthday. So you, so you know why I bring the cookies the first day, it's because the first day of teaching was my birthday. And now, six years later, it's my birthday again. So uh, please enjoy these. Uh, thank you, Julian. Thank you. Uh, I think I have more than enough for everyone. But if I don't, uh, we'll figure it out later. All right. This is also one of the newfangled classrooms. This, this is the new look. They're all going to have this exact same desk where there's nowhere for my laptop, so I put it on top of my bag. I'm trying to improvise. Um, also, the screen comes down with a button. You don't have to pull it anymore, which is good, because that thing never quite works. Anyway, welcome back. This is my first time having the same section twice. It's never lined up that way. Uh, so this will be a little bit, I think, easier. Uh, hopefully, if you like me, welcome back. If you didn't like me, too bad. Um, <laughs> A little bit smaller than last time. I think a couple of you took property to over the summer, I think. Some of you transferred to that other school across town. Uh, but those of you who are here, uh, welcome back, and I think you will enjoy it. Uh, I am not taking attendance today. Uh, I never do on the first day. Things are always in flux. But starting on Wednesday, uh, your reef should work. Um, I think the time might be off by an hour. Don't worry about it. It's, 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 it's all right. It's, it's only one. A uh, proper two section with me this semester. Uh, so basically, everything's the same as last year, uh, just different content. Um, any questions before I get started? Any in your minds? Everyone have a fun summer? Enjoyable? A couple months older and wiser, maybe? No, no, never, never. Okay. And to preempt a question which you all ask me, I'm going to do a review of last year's final or last spring's final. It's going to be on, uh, check me on the date. It's going to be on, it's going to be on a weekend. It's going to be on Saturday the 25th at noon. Uh, I'll record it if you can't come, but I'm going to go over the final exam from last semester for your property one. Um, you're probably not very concerned about the material, but I think it'll be helpful to you to learn what you did and didn't do right because my exams are very similar. Um, if you have any questions, come to that, and I'll go office hours right afterwards, uh, and I will stay until the line goes away. So uh, I encourage you, uh, if you have any questions about your final exam last term, come on by. We're not fighting over your grades, not changing grades. This is for your own knowledge and learning and growth. Uh, this is not going to be a way to uh, fight your grades. It's not going to happen. We don't, we don't change grades. It doesn't work like that. It's final. Anyway, uh, any other questions in your mind? Okay. So what I'd like to do is uh, walk you through the syllabus, which is always my uh, um, first order of business. I think you, am I standing in front of it? Okay, let me, I have to figure out this new classroom. Everything's different. Uh, slightly off. Oh, come on. Crap. Oh, there it is. Anyway, so you all have the syllabus. Um, come on, come on. Let me come on in a second. There it is, okay. Uh, so you'll have the syllabus. That's not what I want to do. I apologize. This is still working at the kinks on uh, in this classroom. Turn that off. Okay. Now we're business. 
I'll tell you a funny story. So my very first day teaching ever at South Texas was actually adverse possession. It was property two. Uh, that was my first class ever. And uh, I'm going to show you a video in a few minutes of, uh, about adverse possession. And that very first day uh, in 2012, um, as I was playing the video, instead of having a closed cup of water, I had one of those Nalgene bottles. Um, I don't have those for a very specific reason. I knocked it over about four minutes into the class. And water went everywhere as this video was playing. And while I tried to mop up this water, I knocked my laptop over on the floor. This was my first day of teaching, my first five minutes. It's on YouTube, by the way. You can find it. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Um, but anyway, so now I have a lid on my cup. Anyway, so property two, same book, right? You have to buy a new book. That's good. Uh, hopefully you appreciate that. Um, all of my old exams are online. You can download them as you wish. Um, I don't have the memo. Uh, I only started doing the memo this past year, so there are no old memos, but I'll do one for your midterm when it comes up. Uh, please have the Chrome app ready. I am aware we had capacity issues last year, so my colleagues did the same thing. Try to sign in. If you can't, same deal. Come to me afterwards. I'll mark you present. Um, if you're not here when the class starts, you are going to be absent. I don't need to explain that to you again. Uh, all of my lectures are available on YouTube. I always encourage you to watch these. OK. Uh, now I'm going to walk through the actual semester. Um, Property two is what you probably thought property law was about. Property one was all very weird stuff. Remember the future interests, right? The rule against perpetuities, things that don't seem practical at all. Property two is significantly more practical. It's the actual way of acquiring property in the year 2018. Uh, last semester was a lot more theoretical. Law students, when they say the word theory, they get, you know, they start shivering, right? Um, this semester is a lot more practical. So let me walk through the semester a bit. Uh, the first two classes don't really fit in anywhere. Um, I don't know why South Texas puts adverse possession property to. It does. If you notice it's in your case book at the very beginning, this topic would make sense when we do the, the Fox case and the finding lost property case and finding, you know, mislaid property. I think it makes more sense there, but this is above my pay grade. Uh, so we teach it at the beginning of property two. Um, so we have two classes in adverse possession, uh, which should be somewhat familiar to you in light of last term's fine topic. Uh, then in class three, we move on to actually buying property. And this is fitting for me. I'm actually closing in a house this week. Uh, it's supposed to be tomorrow. It will probably be a Thursday now. Because uh, I'm delayed, so I'm actually very much tuned into this right now. Um, how do you actually have the contract of sale? How do you work with brokers? Uh, how do you actually disclose defects and the various implied warranties? Um, you'll find a lot of overlap with contract law. Uh, if you remember, last semester said that there was this move in property towards contract law. In the second semester, it's very much contracty, if you will. Then we move on to deeds and how to deliver deeds and various warranties. These are actual documents that convey property has been transferred. Uh, class seven concerns recording systems, right? So when you buy a piece of property, you have to notify people. And the way you notify people you bought property is by taking the deed and bringing it to the court and they record it in this very big book. And that book is a public record for the entire world to see. Chain of title, same idea. Um, by the way, the Jewish holidays this semester hit all the class days, so we're going to have some cancellations and makeups, which I apologize for. Not, not ideal. But uh, this year, the Jewish holidays hit all of the class days. Uh, class 9, you probably know from torts, about nuisance and remedies, uh, which is a little bit of a rehash. Uh, then class 11, SARF, was probably one of the harder aspects of the year. The same way future interests daunted you last semester, uh, the topics of easements and covenants will dawn to you this semester. Uh, what is an easement? An easement is giving some permission to cross your land. Okay. What is a covenant? A covenant is a restriction on how land can be used. Uh, I'm sure you drive around Houston. You see signs, deed, restricted community. You've seen these sorts of signs. That means that there are covenants 
that have been placed on the property that restrict how the property can be used. So for example, only one family homes can be built. Uh, no industrial, only residential, okay? Uh, it sounds easy, but the rules for covenants are very tricky. So when we get to this middle of the road position uh, around the second week in October, uh, after that, it starts getting a little bit easier. Those are the hardest topics. I try to be upfront about that. Uh, then we move on to an area that might sound uh, more like constitutional law, and it does have some shades, which is zoning, right? The power of the state to regulate land usage. So far in this class, we've talked only about private parties. A makes an agreement with person B. But zoning is when the government tells people how they can use their own land. Zoning implicates the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which is known as the Takings Clause, as well as the Due Process Clause. That the government can't deprive you of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. As well, if the government takes your property, they have to pay you. The magic question is, what is a taking? At what point does a government's regulation amount to a taking of property? So that's the topic of zoning. Then we get to eminent domain. Eminent domain is the power of the state to actually legitimately take your property. They say, we want to take your house to build a highway, a road, a hospital, a hotel, an office complex. What purposes can the government take your property for? And how much do they have to pay you for it? Right? That's going to be the subject of eminent domain. Then we get to the topic of regulatory takings. With a regulatory taking, the government says, you keep your property, but we'll tell you how you can use it. You can't build up high, right? You have to install cables on the side of your building. Physical and regulatory ways of affecting your property rights. And that takes us all the way through the end. Your midterm is scheduled for uh, August, I'm sorry, October 10th, they'll be in class. Uh, same deal as last semester, we'll have time to go over it. And we'll have the one-on-one -on -one sessions, which I think at least some of you found that helpful, but uh, don't too bad. Uh, I, I find them useful. They, they, do, they do help. A couple of you did bump up your grades from the midterm to the final, which always makes me happy. And the final exam, we're going to have a review session in class on the 19th. Uh, so we'll do a review. I think that's the last day of class. We can sneak it in. Dirty secret. There's less stuff to learn in property two than in property one. Just there is. I, I don't know why I checked that, but there's just less stuff. So I can actually fit a review session in the last day. You don't have to come in the middle of December, which is fine. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the format of the semester? I mean, I, you probably know the drill. I, I don't need to go into too much. Stuff. Any other questions anything in your minds? No? No? All right, let's start property two then. Um, and I'm going to start with the video, the same video I've been playing for almost seven years now. And uh, this is a video from Flower Mound, Texas. Anyone from Flower Mound, Texas, near Dallas? Okay. All right, so I'm going to play it here. What if you could live in a new home without a mortgage? A man in Flower Mound has done it, moved into a $300,000 house, and he only paid $16 to do it. It's a little-known Texas law, and the, the foreclosure mess could have him living on Easy Street, but his neighbors, well, they're less than thrilled. Catalyst Casey Norton has this exclusive from Flower Mound. Flower Mound's Waterford Drive is lined with well-manicured $300,000 homes. So when a new neighbor moved in without the usual sale, mortgage-paying homeowners had a few questions. What paperwork is it, and how is it legally binding if he doesn't legally own the house? He just squats there. Lee Lowry and her husband told me the house down the street was in foreclosure for more than a year. The owner walked away, then the mortgage company went out of business. Apparently, that opened the door for someone to take advantage of the situation. <laughs> Kenneth Robinson told us he's no squatter. He says he moved in on June 17th after months of research about a Texas law called adverse possession. This is uh, not a normal process. Uh, but it's not a process that's not known. It's just not known to everybody. 
Robinson says this piece of paper gives him rights. And just to you know, have. that says it's an online. Form. It's hard to read. It says affidavit of adverse possession. Just just note that for yourself. It's hard to read from the back. Put it out and filed at the Denton County Courthouse for sixteen dollars. It says the house was abandoned and he's claiming ownership. I went through, look at it, and added some things here. You know what I mean? For my own protection. The house is virtually empty, just a few pieces of furniture, no running water or electricity. But Robinson says just by setting up camp in the living room, Texas law gives him exclusive negotiating rights with the original owner. If the owner wants him out, he would have to pay off his massive mortgage debt, and the bank would have to file a complicated lawsuit. Robinson believes neither is likely. So if he stays in the house, after three years, he can ask the court for the title. That's your goal eventually, is to have title of this home to be the owner of this house? Absolutely. And, uh, owner of record, you know what I mean, at this point, you know. And actually, he says owner of record. That's actually important. He, he actually understands the concept. I'll get back. He said owner of record. Just keep that in mind. Since I possess it, I am the owner now. Robinson posted no trespassing signs after neighbors asked police to arrest him for breaking in. But Flower Mound officers say they can't remove him from the property because home ownership is a civil matter, not criminal. Lowry and her neighbors continue to look for legal ways to get him out. Or if he wants the house buy the house like everyone else had to get the money buy the house robinson says he's not buying anything as far as he's concerned the three hundred thirty thousand dollar home is already his and he has the paperwork to prove it casey norton channel 8 news now foreclosures are down for the sixth month in a row in north texas august filings fell 14 percent compared to last year however something to keep in perspective foreclosures are still 313 percent higher than in august of 2000. All right, so, Brooke, sorry that's over there. What's Mr. Robinson trying to do here? What 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 what's his end game? Okay, he wants a bundle of sticks, and how how is he going about getting this bundle of sticks? Through adverse possession. Okay, so in his mind, we'll see if he's right or wrong in a minute, right? But in his mind, what does he have to do to get ownership of this house in a very nice block, a very, you know, pretty, pretty big house? He said he had to remain there for three years. So three years, okay. He also filed some with the court affidavit. Okay, very good. So I have the Texas adverse possession statute. I put it in the um, uh, in, in the class notes for today. I'll bring it up for you now. So here it is. I'll read it to you. You can't see it. It's section 16.024 of the text. By the way, a lot more Texas stuff this year than last year. Just it's much more specific. So it says, let me make this a little bit bigger so you can read it. There we go. Can you guys read that? Is that big enough for you? Still working out the kinks of this classroom. I'll get it, I promise. I, I have con law from 7.30 till 9.30 tonight. I'll be, I'll be set for those guys. It says, a person must bring suit to recover real property held by another in peaceable and adverse possession under title or color of title not later than three years after the day the cause of action accrues. Okay, that's what it says. So Josh, what, what's Ms. Robinson think here? What, what does he have to do to get this three-year limit? What does he have to actually demonstrate? That he's using the property more than the actual owner is. So, I'm reading that statute. That's all the statute says. What's actually required? Since it's a house, we live there. Okay. So look, it says, Section 1621, definition. Adverse possession. Okay. What is adverse possession? An actual and visible appropriation of real property commenced and continued under claim of right that is inconsistent with and is hostile to the claim of another person. So let's just walk through this one step at a time, right? Mr. Robinson says he only needs to stay there for three years, right? Why three years? There's another statute. Section, that was section 1624. This is 1625. This one has a five year statute of limitation. 
It says a person must bring suit not later than five years after the day the cause of action accrues. And he must, has to pay taxes, has to have a registered deed, etc. First off, uh, oh, got a name tag. Uh, Matt, okay, they'll come back to me, I promise. Matt, why is Mr. Robinson saying he needs only three years rather than five years? In other words, what's the difference between this three year period and this five year period? Well, not after five years, right? What type of claim is required for a three-year period? It says it right up there. Keep going. No, no, average possession under? Read it. What's color of title? Yeah, what's color of title? It's in the reading. Mm. Read. Bingo. Bingo. I, I, I flagged it, right? Mr. Robinson was a sophisticated guy, right? I'll give you a preview. He didn't win in the end. We'll get to that in a minute. But he is a sophisticated guy. He says, look, if I have color of title, I can do this in three years, not five years. And Reed is correct. When you are trying to acquire property through adverse possession, the law recognizes this is kind of unfair, right? It's kind of unfair. You didn't pay for it. Someone else paid for it. But you're going to get the property if you jump through certain hoops, right? And one of the hoops you jump through is whether you've done stuff in accordance with the law, right? Do you have some sort of deed? Some sort of piece of paper, right, that recognizes you're the rightful owner. Now, I don't think the, the affidavit that Mr. Robinson filed is worth the papers written on, right? With respect, I don't know what he wrote. I, I've, I've been looking at that video for seven years. I can't read what he wrote. I have no idea what he wrote, but it's probably worthless. But Ryan, let's say we have a different situation, right? Let's say that you buy a house tomorrow, and you think everything's great, and the seller hands you a deed, looks good to you. And then you live in this house for 30 years, you raise your family there, you have your you know, birthdays and weddings, everything, right? And then 30 years later, Ryan, someone shows up and says, the deed you got was a forgery. The deed you have is fake, not worth the paper it's written on. I am the true owner, right? See, my deed is, is legitimate, your deed's a forgery. Ryan, what's the significance of the fact that you had a deed that, again, it was forged, but you, you had this deed that, 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 you, that you live with for 30 years in your home? But, but, but why should you be rewarded for having this, this forged deed? And what did you do based on that deed? What, what, what's that key word in the law we, we think about? I'm sorry? Well, you paid for it, but even more importantly, what did you do based on the deed? Reliance, right? Reliance. Reliance is a very important concept in the law. Remember from contracts, detrimental reliance, right? Estoppel, these things you rely on. So the law seeks to reward the person who, in good faith, thought he bought a house, but he got a forged deed. Right? Adverse possession is at once, once fair and unfair. And think of it from different perspectives. You have Ryan, who bought this house with a forged deed, lived there for 30 years, and then some guy shows up out of the blue and says, no, no, that's my house. Right? Adverse possession says... Here, the equity is cut in Ryan's favor. This other guy knew or should have known that a squatter was there for 30 years and did nothing about it. And if the original owner can't take care of his own remedies, then neither will the court. So in many respects, because Ryan played by the rules, 
He got his deed. It was a fake, but he got his deed. The law rewards him. And then after a certain number of years, it becomes his property. Now, that's the easy case, right? Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's nice. Ryan's got the house. Now, what if you have Mr. Robinson, right? And again, I'm not disparaging. He, this guy, is, he was fairly sophisticated, not a lawyer. But he says, you know what? This house is empty. It's got foreclosed on it. This was during the foreclosure uh, mess a couple years ago. He says, look, this house is empty. I'm going to set up shop, sit down in this chair. For three years, the house is mine. Jake, are the equities the same for Ryan's situation than for Mr. Robinson's situation? Just the equities. Put aside the law for a minute. Just the equities. Did he pay for the house? Did he put property taxes year after year? Did he, you know, improve the house at all? But in theory, if Mr. Robinson camped out there for three years, maybe five years, would he have gotten title? So then why does the law reward a person like Mr. Robinson just the same as it rewards someone like Jake? I'm sorry, Ryan. Now, we'll get to the four factors, but just, just as, a, as a philosophical matter, right? How is it fair, Jake, that Mr. Robinson just set up shop there, sit there for a couple years, boom, he gets a $300,000 house in his pocket? How, how can that be right? I get if you're living there, you're improving, you're paying taxes, you were, you were, you were deceived, you got this forged deed, but how do we, how do we justify as an ethical matter Mr. Robinson getting the house? Oh, give me more. What do you mean it wasn't in use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Caitlin, let me, let me ask you a different question, right? Forget houses. Houses are recent. Let's say we go back to England, right? And you have a farm. And then someone leaves a farm abandoned for years. And then someone else comes along and starts developing it and planting crops and using the soil and, you know, improving the land. Do the equity seem a little different there? Maybe it's a little bit more fair to have average possession? It's kind of like rewarding the best use. Oh, yeah. Who puts the land to its best use, right? I think, I, I think Caitlin makes a fair point. So at, at its heart, adverse possession is about someone who can maybe use the land for a better purpose, improving it. But is it required to improve? Right? Esther, did Mr. Robinson make any improvements to this property? Not that I can tell. Maybe, maybe he did. Right? But as far as I can tell, he made no improvements to the property. Okay. My sister calling me wish me happy birthday. I'll call her back later. <laughs> um, anyway. But that's the that's the rub of Azra's possession, right? That's the rub. You're basically saying if you don't exercise your remedies, if you don't exercise your right to reclaim the property, you lose it. We did something similar last year, if I can even mention it, the right of entry. Remember the future interest? If a condition was violated, the original owner had to take steps to reclaim the property. If he failed to retake those steps, too bad, he loses out. And there is a statute of limitation on that. It's the same idea. The law doesn't like to reward someone. I'm sorry, the law punishes someone who doesn't act quickly. And there's probably a good reason for this, right? Why is the limit in Texas three years or five years or 10 years, whatever it happens to be? I'll give you a good reason. Evidence fades. Memories fade. People might not remember, oh yeah, I entered on Monday or Friday. I don't know exactly when I entered. Yeah, I was there for five years, maybe it was seven years. People don't remember. And especially mm -hmm. before computers, evidence was made of paper and paper has a habit of vanishing. So. A reason why you have a statute of limitations of three years or five years or whatever it is, is to make the claim come to court quickly. Don't let this linger for 30 years. Because if you let it linger for 30 years, no one remembers what happened, and the current owner is probably going to prevail. So you have to think about this in a couple ways, right? One, it promotes efficiency. The land can be used in a more efficient manner. It promotes fairness, right? In the case of Jake, I, in the case of Ryan, for example, you've been there 30 years, you have this forged document. But it's not just about fairness, it's also about who's putting the land to the highest use, right? But at bottom, you can have the person like Mr. Robinson who comes in there and says, screw it, it's mine, give me three years. The law still gives it to him because he has 
the right claim. Now, um, in hindsight, as you probably guessed, um, Mr. Robinson, um, his claim didn't work out. Um, the Tarrant County, that's, that's near Dallas, the district attorney up there, said all these affidavits were fraudulent. And he told the clerk's office not to accept them. Again, I don't know what he even wrote on this paper. I've tried to say, I don't know. Um, and Mr. Robinson, after he got in the news, other people followed him. And apparently dozens of people <laughs> tried to file these affidavits in the courthouse to claim property like Mr. Robinson. Um, none of them worked. And as a footnote, uh, I think Bank of America, one of the other big banks eventually came across his house and they moved to eject him. Now again, that's not a criminal matter. This wasn't a trespass. That, that you have to realize, right? He had a claim to the property. And if he had stayed there for three years, he might have prevailed. One second. But he didn't. And within, I think, maybe a week or two of this news story coming on TV, <laughs> he, got, he, got, he got kicked out. So I guess the rule of thumb is, if you're trying to squat, don't go on TV. But the flip side is you have to make it known. So, you know, but it didn't work out too well. I think Mr. Robinson actually gave a, a workshop at SMU Law School on this, which I don't know how that happened. But anyway, Mike. Is there a, uh, a window at the beginning of a, the squatting period that it's considered trespassing like the first 24 or 48 hours? It's trespassing the first three years. That the that the record owner can call on a trespass, but a neighbor. The na exactly that was that's point. The neighbor can't right, right. If the at that point the house was foreclosed, I think the bank was the owner. Record, the bank could have called for a trespass action, uh, although properly it's what's called an action and ejectment, right? Because Mr. Robinson claims that he has a legal right to be there, so you have to adjudicate it. And the court says no, no, no. At this present moment, you've been there for three days, whatever it was. You reject it. Okay. Any questions on that? But just understand that in some cases, average possession seems very fair. In other cases, like what the hell? This can't be right. And then that neighbor, I think, was the what the hell version of the of the of the fact pattern. <laughs> she did not look happy because I mean, think about it. She paid what three hundred thousand dollars for this house, probably at the peak of the of the real estate market. Now her house was probably underwater, and now you have these squatters moving in. Again, and it's also dangerous, right? Um, just think about this for a minute. He had no electricity, no water. And what sometimes happens, and this is really dangerous, is you have squatters run a power line from next door, like an extension cord. Okay, those things are really dangerous. Create fires, there's no water, no sprinklers. Like you can, there's a risk of doing this to actually legitimately live there. Okay? All right, now, uh, uh, name? Yeah. Oh, where are they? Pass them back, Mike. Are there more? <laughs> and the markers. Just I, I brought a hundred. There's not nearly a hundred of you in here. If you don't have one, just ask me that later. And the markers. I bought six markers. Let's see how many of them I get back. Right. Last time I got about half of them back. But the, the words are six. Anyway. So Harris, let me ask you this question. We think we have a three-year limitation period, right? Let's just assume he was three years. Probably five, but let's say it's three. Is Mr. Robinson required to sit there for three years on that chair? It's fine. In a minute, it's fine. Is he required to sit there for three years on that chair without getting up, can't even leave the front door? So how do we measure the time period? Um, so it would, be, it would have to be some sort of manner that's mm. continuous. Mm. Continuous. Okay, very good. Very good. So let's go through the elements of adverse possession, right? Um, the first three are pretty easy to apply. The fourth one may have given you some confusion when you're doing your reading. So that's OK, I understand. Uh, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time the fourth one at the end of class today as well into the next class. But there are four elements of adverse possession. This is not a nice way of typing, but I'll figure it out. I think I'm just going to steal one from the other room after the class is over. Uh, Okay. Okay. So the first element is you have to have an entry, right? Katie, what does it mean you have to have an entry? Why? Why is that important for this for this calculus? Because uh, you have to have a call to trespass. Yes. And Katie, why do you need to have that initial trespass? Why is that so important? Bingo. 
The entry starts the ticking clock. Someone give Jolene a marker. They're all over the place. I, one that went out. I, there are six in the bag. Oh, I didn't pass the bag. I, I only got one marker. That's why I was sending one out. Ah. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> I, brought, I, I, I bought 12 new markers, six for each class. Hope I get all of them back. We'll see. All right, just throw them around. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jolene, just you'll figure this out. Leave it to the engineer, okay? She'll, she'll, she'll get this done. Okay, so the reason why entry is so important is it starts the clock. The initial act of trespassing, right? The initial act of trespassing is what starts the three or the five year limitation period, right? I can tell you on exam questions in years past when I test about this, the, 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 the issue of entry can be very vague. In this case, it wasn't in doubt, right? In this case, it wasn't in doubt. Mr. Robinson walked into the house, and he says, all right, it's mine. But what if, say, you're invited as a guest, and at some point you stop paying rent? At what point did you actually enter? So these are actually fairly difficult questions. But in the case of today, the entry date is, is, is straightforward. Okay? The second factor is that the entry must be open and notorious. Let me make this bigger so you can see it. Open, notorious. Uh, is that Lance? Lance, what does that mean, open and notorious? I'm sorry, did I, I, I skip? I'm sorry, Alec, I skipped one. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll come back to you, Lance, in a minute. Sorry, you're not done. Yes. This is an important factor. Notorious, like, like Notorious B.I.G., right? It has to be, well, more people now know Notorious R.B.G. than, than B.I.G. That wasn't the case six <laughs> years ago. But um, anyway, we saw that movie. Good movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was in the movie, the, the Ginsburg movie? A couple of people? What's that? Yeah, there's a book. There's also a tote bag and a, the, the memes. It's <laughs> enough, 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 enough. There. It's a cult following. Yeah, well, you said it, not me. Um, but notorious means it's well-known. And this is a matter of fairness. If you're going to squat on a property, you can't do so quietly. You have to do so in a way that is known to the original owner so that he's on notice. Now, you don't have to actually, substitute, you don't have to actually say, hey, knock, knock, I'm squatting on your property. But you have to be there in a way that could be visible. We'll do the case later in class, Manila versus Gorski. And in that case, you had the steps that what? Went over 15 inches, right? Was that notorious? Was it open? OK. But for Mr. Robinson, there's no question, right? There's no question that it was open notorious. The guy went on, on you know, TV and said it. So that's easy. OK. Our third factor is continuous for the statutory period. Statutory period. Um, be careful that you have the right period. Because at least in Texas, if you have no paperwork, it's five years. And if you have some paperwork, it's three years. And that actually does make a difference in your squatting. Now, the continuous factor, I'll go back to Lance, is a little bit tricky to apply. Right, again, there's no requirement that Mr. Robinson sit in the house for five years straight. He can get up, go to work, go to the grocery store, right? Do various things. But Lance, what's the test to measure continuity? What's the right test? Is it just uh, uh, like what the ordinary course? Exactly, exactly. The, the test is, are you using the property in the same fashion in the same fashion that the original owner would use it in. So for example, let's say it's a summer home. If the original owner went there for three months out of the year, that's all you have to do. Let's say it's a ski resort, right? And it's only used in the winter. That's all you have to squat it for. And there are various cases, you know, um, say someone has a forest and you're squatting on the forest and they, you know, take timber down in a couple months of the year, 
you have to do the same. It's a very fact specific question, um, but but it's you know it's very context specific of how the original owner would have used it, and that can be litigated. But yeah, Mike. In the case of something like the summer home, is it, is it considered uh, is the continuity broke if the original owner comes in for three of the months that the oh. water is not there? That's a good question. Um, I think that would probably break it because he'd be ejecting him, and that way he can't come back in the next the following summer. A good question, though. Yes, Lauren. So, since they have to be using it in a similar way as the owner, would the fact that he doesn't have electricity and water, would that be something that could say he's not using it like an owner would, would use it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I think the short answer is that this continuity factor was drafted before electricity was a thing, right? So, um, I suppose you could argue that living in a house with electricity and power and water and these sorts of things is one thing, and poor Mr. Robinson sitting there in that chair with nothing to do may not be even continuous at all. Uh, I don't. I, I think that might be going a little bit too far with the power, but I, I see your point. Good, good argument. Yeah, Kendra. Um, so going back to the summer home, if the original owners moved back in, though, wouldn't that kind of be considered like self-help and are you allowed, not allowed to do that? Would not it be really. self-help? Well, during the five-year period, the original owner has the ultimate prerogative to evict. So I don't think it'd be self-help. I think they're exercising their rights. In fact, they may not have found out about it until three months in. Again, the, the continuity one, if you look at some of my old exams, um, I often ask about this in midterm in particular. When there are various like breaks where things happen and maybe the original owner comes back in, how do you reset the clock? It's a very, it's a very tricky question of how you told the clock. Yes, yes, Andrew. Um, the way you were describing, I kind of think about this question on the kind of stories that I had. Um, with the owner, like, like in your instance with the summer home and the forest and everything, the owner just never finds out someone's squatting there. The no squatter yeah. cleans up after before he leaves. It's on a thousand acre forest that's just cutting trees on the other end in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way they would. It's got to be open. So if it's not open, the clock never starts. There has to be some evidence that something there's gotta, there's gotta be something to put the guy in notice, right? Again, it, it doesn't have to be so as obvious as to knock on your door and say, hey, I'm squatting, but it has to be something to put a reasonable person on notice. I think it's a reasonable person standard. And if, you know, your example is a good one, right? He's on the land, cleans up after himself, never makes a mess. If there's no way of knowing, your clock doesn't start. Again, if you're the squatter, you don't want that. Right? Imagine that you manage to sneak around for five years and you get nothing for it. That's not that's not advantageous for anybody. Any questions on the third one? You need a hey, yeah. uh, statement about with paperwork and it's three years without paperwork and it's five years. What paperwork are we talking about? We're talking about color of title. I'll get there okay. later, right? I'm trying to be a little bit circumspect, but color of title. I'll do it now. You asked. So go back to the Texas statute. Okay. Okay. Go back to the text of statute. Uh, it's on the screen. <laughs> Section 1624 puts a three year limitation period when you have color of title. Color of title is a fairly broad phrase that refers to some sort of paperwork. Okay. Now, again, I don't think Mr. Robinson's forged deed counts. But the example I gave to Jake a few minutes ago where you buy a house and you have some paperwork to show. It's a forged deed, but it's, you know, you relied on it in good faith. Um, what does color mean in this context? It means kind of, but not really, right? It's like you don't have an actual title, but it's like a shade of title, if you will. I think of color as like a shade. You have a shade of it that's kind of like it. Um, You'll see this phrase a lot, like color of law, color of title. It means you have like a quasi title. Okay? That's a three year period. Five year period is if you don't have color of title. But note the law imposes a greater burden on you if you don't have color of title. You have number one, to actually cultivate, use, and enjoy it. You have number two, you gotta pay property tax on it. If you don't pay the property taxes, you don't get it. And you have three. You have to have a, a registered deed to actually try to claim it. Okay, so don't get bogged down in the specifics. But what you have to know is, if you have paperwork, color of title, it's a little bit easier on you, less time. 
if you're like Mr. Robinson, you got five years and you have more requirements. By the way, to Lauren's question, if Mr. Robinson didn't pay his property taxes like a normal taxpayer would, he's out. Oh. So that, that much is at least that much. Um, this phrase uses the property. Maybe electricity falls under uses. I don't know. I would think it would fall in like the cultivate. Maybe. You know, as far as like saying, like if he would have let, you know, let the weed grow in the yard. Good point. Like yeah. If he's not gardening, maybe it's a good point. Yeah. Mike? I was going to mention that similarly uh, with HOA violations or just general homeowner maintenance. If, if they're not taking care of the things that a, the original mm -hmm. homeowner mm -hmm. would be expected yeah. to. Good point. Or on the other hand, if they went and added a off-grid electrical system, so they didn't have to have water, they added a well pump, so they didn't have or they, to have water. They have a hose coming from the neighbor's yard. Yeah. Which happens. I mean, this act, people run hoses, and you're, you're nodding. You know about this? Where, where have you seen this? Um, in Kenya. In Kenya, is there is there a big squatting problem there? Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. It's. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the government will take money from anyone. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I haven't thought this logistically, but if you go to the, uh, the county office and say, hi, I'd like to pay $5,000 for the property of this house, I don't think they're going to ask you any questions. I mean, it's also possible that, you know, maybe your relative, your friend pays your taxes for you. There are lots of circumstances, but you have the receipt and you show that you paid for it. Yeah, again, if, if there's a... Um, if there's, a, if there's a tax bill due, I don't think the government's going to ask too many questions about who's paying. It's like, yes, money. Thank you. Especially if the property's been sitting empty for five years. What about the back taxes? I'm sorry? The back taxes. So... Well, uh, well, I mean, look at the statute, right? The statute says pays applicable taxes. I think that would be from the point you enter. I don't think it applies to back taxes, but uh, maybe. Not sure. All right, let's do the last element. The last element is that your entry must be adverse and under a claim of right. Adverse and under a claim of right. This is by far the hardest of the four factors to apply and always gives students the most difficulty. So the first thing to make your lives easier do not confuse claim of right with color of title. Again, do not confuse claim of right and color of title. Color of title refers to paperwork, right? You have some sort of paperwork showing you have an interest in the property. Okay. Claim of right is something else, right? Claim of right focuses primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on your state of mind, your mens rea. If I can scar you back to one, all right? It refers to your state of mind, your intent, how you're approaching the acquisition of this property. And what complicates this for all of you is that there are different types of claims of right that are required, different types of state of mind that are required. This is the second case, the Manillo case. But when you see adverse and under claim of right, just in your mind, substitute that for state of mind. That, that's what it's getting at. Again, don't confuse claim of right with color of title. I swear, half of you will do that in the term. It's just, it's, it's just one of those things where people see, oh, claim, color, same thing. They're, they're, they're different concepts. All right, so any questions on the four factors? We'll do the Van Val. Oh, I love this name, Van Valkenburg. Right? What a good name for a case. First case ever taught, right? We'll do Van Valkenburg in a minute. Any questions? Okay. Can you show you next, I think? Okay. All right. Uh, walk me through uh, the facts, please, in Van Valkenburg versus Lutz, which is a great name for a case.
Okay, very good. All right, so let me, thank you, Khadija. So let me walk you through this, right? Um, this is a classic case of neighbors who just don't get along. And um, this legal dispute stretched beyond the lives of the neighbors, right? This is that their kids are you know, litigating it. Um, how much of this could have been resolved with you know, a simple conversation like 40 years earlier? But, but this is why lawyers get money. Um, and this is why good lawyers get more money. Because <laughs> there was some really bad lawyering in this case from top to bottom. And, and just, I want to mention this at the outset. You are now two L's, right? Uh, have any of you worked on your practice certificate? You know, the, we take them to your practice, right? Soon? If you make legal mistakes, your client can sue you for malpractice. You don't think about this, right? If you give bad legal advice, your client can sue you. And this would be something simple, right? Where, say, if you miss a deadline, right? Ha, huh, your lawsuit's gone. Or maybe um, you fail to file the correct appeal, which happened in this case. Claim's gone. But the worst thing you can do is waive a claim. What does that mean? You say, well, Your Honor, we agree we don't own the land, but we want something else. No. Because when you waive something in the trial court, when you get to the appeals court, you're out of luck. The issue's gone. You've waived it. So if you make no, if you do nothing else in practice, don't waive stuff. Say, Your Honor, we object, we object, we object, and then deal with it later. So what happened here is this long process. In the 1920s, the Lutzes purchased uh, lots number 14 and 15. Um, and there's a reference to a paper street. Do you know what a paper street is? A paper street. You know what this is? Yeah. It's the road that exists on that that doesn't really exist. Very good. How do you know that? I had to Google it. Mm. <laughs> I'm glad someone did. But do you know why it's called a paper street? So this is actually funny. Before Google, right, people would copy maps. How do you prove someone plagiarized your map? You would insert fake streets in there. And if they copied your fake street, it's not a real street, that's proof they, they violated your copyright. So it was called a paper street because it was just on paper. It wasn't real. And if you ever see the movie Fight Club, Tyler Durden lived on paper street. Uh-huh. Okay. Anyway, so... They bought lots 14 and 15. It would have been easy enough for them to have just walked down here, da 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 da, to get to the main street, but they found it was too steep. So they decided to walk across this little triangle shape, right? This is lots 19 through 22. And they would walk across it every single day to try to get to the main road. Now, we're here talking primarily about adverse possession, right? Acquiring property. But there's something also called prescription. Let me give you this phrase. Pre prescription or a prescriptive easement. Prescription or the prescriptive easement are the same thing. What that means, if I walk across someone's property every day for five years, and I do so openly and notoriously with a hostile state of mind, I don't acquire the land. What I acquire is the right to cross it, right? It's a form of adverse possession. Again, you don't own the land, but you have what's called an easement, which is basically permission to cross it whether the owner likes it or not. And if you gain one of these prescriptive easements, guess what? Owner can't build a fence. He can't block you off because you have a right, a vested right to cross. I understand that, right? So for example, um, 30 Rock, Rockefeller Center in, in Manhattan, right? There's actually part of it that's a private street. Every year, they shut down Rockefeller Center for one day, this little sidewalk. Why? To make sure no one can try and claim adverse possession on them. They just block off access one day a year. 
so that no one can claim it's a ha, it wasn't continuous. So, uh, uh, Kendall, you're Mr. Lutz's lawyer, right? You know your clients been walking across this lot for you know decades, and then suddenly they put up a fence and put these scary guard dogs, right? What claim do you make in court? Uh, possession. Well, not just average possession. What do you claim? Okay, so you claim prescription, right? That you're walking across the land. But Kendall, is that all that you claim? Yeah. No. <laughs> you tell me. What else do you claim? The right to own it, to use it. And what do we call that? Bingo. You raise two claims, right? You say, number one, I have a prescriptive easement. That is, I have the right to cross the land. You can't build a fence. And two, you claim adverse possession. The lawyer here screwed up, right? For reasons we'll never know, he didn't claim both, which is just a really bad mistake, right? It's a terrible mistake. And the, and the Court of Appeals nailed him on this one. So, Marcella, what's the argument that the Lutzes actually acquire the land through adverse possession? Not just the prescriptive easement, the walking part, but actually acquired this lot 19 through 22. No, uh, no, that lawyer is an idiot, right? I'm asking you. You're a smart lawyer, right? What do you argue? That that lawyer screwed the pooch, right? He he messed it up. Okay, walk me through those, please. Okay, and how did the Lutzes actually enter that triangular, this red, right, this triangle shape area? Walking. Well, not just walking. What did they do specifically for adverse possession? A little bit more? What did they, what they do? Like they made like a... What, what did they do on this land, Marcella? The farm. They built a farm. They built a farm, yeah. They built a farm. They, they put the chicken coops, right? They, they planted vegetables. Uh, Charlie, I think, was the brother. They built a house there. They cultivated the land. They used the land. That was their entry, right? Their entry was they actually did stuff on it, right? And uh, let's see, Nick. Samantha, thank you. I, I'll get your names real quick. I know you all just me a little, 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 little reacclimation period. Samantha, mm -hmm. was that open and notorious? The fact that they had this farm there and the chickens, everything. Yes. How do we know it was open and notorious? They had testimony that like the neighbors told them that a lot that belonged to the Lutzes. They took the house. They knew it was Charlie's house. Exactly. There was no doubt, right? It was known in the neighborhood as the Lutz house, the Lutz farm, Charlie's house. They knew there were chickens. People sold vegetables. They you know, went to the market and bought them, right? So there's no, there's no doubt. And we know that the von Valkenbergs were aware of this, right? Samantha, how do we know the von Valkenbergs knew about this? Yeah. Yeah, baby got bad blood, right? There was really bad blood. They were, ch they were chasing the guy with a pipe, right? They were chasing the kids with a pipe. They knew this was there. Right? So open, notorious, continuous. It's been for years going on, right? Right? And uh, one more. Uh, da, da. Justin, yeah, Justin. Is your, what was the claim of right? <laughs> what was the uh, state of mind of the, uh, of the Lutzes? Uh, he was under the impression that it was on his property. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's mine be damned. It's mine. Get off, right? There was no doubt that this was a hostile acquisition, right? They were notorious. They were very angry at each other. So, Lucas, why did the Lutzes lose, right? We just went through the four factors. I think we got them all. One, two, three, four. Why did the court rule against the Lutzes? Well, what, what did the court require that was a little bit strange? The, the, the court here, I think the book makes points saying the court's wrong. I, I agree with the book. I don't think the court was right here. But let's try to understand. What did the court say here that the Lutzes didn't meet their, their burden of proof? They needed a, uh, they needed a written document. They needed an actual document of them saying that they own the property. Where does it say that? To acquire title to the 
by hybrid but not down to the point that written instrument and must be shown by clear and convincing proof that for at least 15 years. So do they need, do they, do you need a written instrument to acquire through adverse possession? Is that what it says? No. Clear and convincing proof. Okay, good. That for at least 15 years. But what do they, Lucas, I'll stay in you for another minute. What do they need proof of? <coughs> it is actual. Occupation. Actual. Okay. Here's where I think the court goes um, off the rails a bit. Costa, what does the court require to show actual possession? Oh, I skipped Roxy and Ned. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, oh, uh, this entire row I skipped. Okay, I'll come back to you guys in a minute. Sorry. All right, Costa, you're up now. No others are deemed to have, they say that no others have been deemed to be held uh, uh, adversely. So essentially, Costa, let me ask you the question a little more simply. I think you're on the right track. Did the court find it adequate that they had a chicken coop and they had a farm and they had a house? Was that, was that enough for, for the court to, to, was that enough proof? No. No. Why not? Why did the court say it wasn't enough? Everyone, I think it's that. Why did the court say that the chicken coop and the farm and the, you know, the house wasn't enough? For Spencer's Yeah. Why was that not adequate? Because Lev thought he was building it on his on his property. No. 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 Why did the court find that evidence was inadequate? Uh, no, 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 I'm looking for it. Roxy? Um, because then he had the opportunity to assert his rights and his ability to compete. Well, let's just focus on, on the chicken coop, right, and the farm. What did the court say about the chicken coop in the farm? Gus, you want to take a stab? Yeah, it says there were. There is no proof that the that it was protected by a substantial enclosure. Ah, uh -huh. say it again, Gus. So everyone can hear you, please. There is no proof here that the subject premises were protected by a substantial enclosure. So what are they getting at, right, Casa? Just in your own words, what, what, what are they getting at there? I go back to Roxy. Roxy, do you think the court was persuaded that this was actually a proper usage of the land in some way? Was it enough using the land enough? Look, no, they said they didn't utilize the entire. Ah, there we go. Now we're in business, right? The court faulted the Lutzes for not using the entirety of the property. The entirety. What the heck does that mean? Hadia, let me come back to you. Yeah, like your rule got re re reclaimed. What does it mean they didn't use the entirety of the property? What can that possibly mean? How do you use every square inch of soil? Is that even possible? No. Did they use a lot of it? They used some of it, right? I mean, I, I, don't ask me, how much room do you need to have a farm and chicken coop? I don't know. Chickens have to run around, use an empty space. I, you know, I don't know how this stuff works, right? So the majority makes this assertion that, that I think has to be wrong, right? The majority asserts that they didn't have enough of an enclosure, and then they didn't utilize, utilize enough of the, of the land. But that's never been the requirement, right? The requirement is you use the land in the same way as a true owner would have used it. That's the requirement. You know, maybe the true owner would have built a house that could have used more of the land, and these guys using a farm and chicken and whatever. But there was a house there. It was a Char Charlie's house was right there. So I think that was one of the first mistakes that the majority made. And I think the dissent calls them out saying this was never the correct standard. Okay. Any questions in that part? All right, Celeste, I'll come back to you, please. Thank you. Plus, let me ask you this question. What sort of state of mind did the majority require? Right? What did the majority require the, the claim of uh, a right to be? Wasn't it that he had to, didn't he know 
else's? Yeah, right? Basically, the majority says you have to know it's someone else's property. You have to know it. But, Celeste, why does that not make any sense? So, why is that such a bizarre standard? What's wrong with that standard? Um, I think the issue with that standard is that, like in the other case, you, you can think that it is your land. Yeah. It's a hostility to There's a mistake, it. right? The usual case is this the Lutzes think it's theirs. And the Val, 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 God, Val Valkenberg, Val, Van Valkenberg thinks it's theirs. There's a, there's a dispute. But New York says that Lutz must know it belongs to the other guy. That's not the correct standard. So I think this case screwed up adverse possession law in two um, significant respects, right? First, it defined entry in a, in, a, in a strange way. It says to enter, you must enter the entire property, every square inch. And that's, that's never been the correct standard. Right? And I think they also screw up the fourth factor. Right? You don't have to know it belongs to the other guy. You can think, no, 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 it's mine. I've acquired it, and therefore I'm going to keep it. So I think factors one and four, um, the, court, the court messed up on here. And the dissent does, I think, a pretty good job of responding. Um, and one thing for you to keep in mind, not just in property, but in general, when the majority never responds to dissent, that means they you know they're wrong. Right? Usually when there's a good majority opinion, it responds to the census. Here, what, here's why the sense wrong. You got nothing, right? It, it doesn't make any effort to engage in this. Okay. So um, let me summarize the, the first case, if I, if I can. Um, because the Lutzes didn't use the entirety of the property, no adverse possession. And because the Lutzes didn't have the state of mind where they knew it belonged to the other guy, no adverse possession. At best, all they have is a claim for prescriptive easements. That's all they can get, perhaps. OK, any questions on the first case on Van Valkenburg versus Lutz? What a, I love that name. And I actually Googled this. This is the, the Van Valkenburg coat of arms, which is very, very regal. Julian? I'm sorry? Almost looks like the Lannisters. The what? The Lannisters. Game of Thrones ah. reference. Okay. Yeah. So under a claim of right, the fourth one. Yeah. So it says that they either believe that they own it or that they have some claim of right. But the Lutz has never believed that they own the land. They were hostile. Well, I think the, the facts are actually a little bit unclear about this, right? They may have actually thought they acquired through adverse possession, but I think the more reasonable inference is they thought they were just squatting and it was going to be theirs. Like it was just, it was, they, they wanted to own that. I think that's probably more reasonable. What do you think? I, just because they said we didn't own it, they, they never laid claim to it, it felt like that element was not met because you're supposed to, part of it is that you have a claim that you own the property. Mm -hmm. And without that, then it seemed like one element. Well, you can actually show under claim of right ownership, even if you don't have an intent, it might be an objective standard. It might not even matter. Okay. But in other words, the, the New York court here imposed a requirement that you have to know the other person owns it. And there could actually be a dispute about who owns it, in which case you don't meet the requirement. If I had to guess, if I asked Mr. Lutz, he'd say, this is my property. I've had my house here for 20 years. He may not know the specifics of adverse possession. I was like, this is mine. I've acquired it. It's now mine. That's why I think yesterday to ask what he would say. You've been wrong. I don't know. And the, the, van, the van people. Von Valkenberg, yeah. It's a hard one to they, say. Yeah, them. When they purchased the property after Lutz had been using it over a long period of time. So why did they not have to purchase the property from Lutz if. Okay, so this is a good question, right? When the Von Valkenbergs purchased the property, it was at a sale, right? Right. Um, at that point, who was the actual owner? If the Lutzes had actually gone to the courthouse and registered a deed, the sale may have never happened. Okay. I'm guessing the reason why the sale happened in the first place is because there was nothing the government knew to put them on notice of this other party. What the Von Valkenberg should have done is where they put a bid on to oh crap, there's this house on here. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's some doubt about the title. So if anything, the Von Valkenberg should be faulted because they didn't do their homework. 
but the Lutzes should have God. filed some sort of paperwork after you. They should have, because otherwise there's no way for the auction sale to know. We don't know who the true owner is. The true owner is just MIA in this case. The city took ownership, but at some point before, someone was the owner, right? Someone had it at some point. Okay. So any questions on the first case? All right. The second case is a New Jersey case. And I don't even need to tell you. What happens with the New Jersey case? They are reversing the common law without... Without any doubt, you you know you know the outcome of this case. They're going to reverse the common law. You know you know you know the drill. So the facts of this case are actually easy enough, and they're fairly common. Right? You have two houses next to each other. They're roughly the same size. Then over the number of years, you make improvements upon the property, and then at some point, you build a staircase. The staircase comes close to the boundary. Then you raise up the property, and then you make the stairs a little bit longer. And then the steps stretch, was it 15 inches? 15 inches, I mean, that, that, you know, it's not very long, over the property line. You all know from a trespass, a trespass is one centimeter. Even the smallest bits of trespass doesn't matter how long it is. So what happened is, for all these years, one neighbor was trespassing onto the property of the other neighbor. Now this case doesn't turn out the way you think it will, right? You think the case is going one way, and it takes a sharp turn in Jersey to the left, as, as it turns out, right? Um, but let's walk through this, right? The fourth element of adverse possession we know is called claim of right. Okay? And I said this refers to state of mind. And there are three types of state of mind, okay? The differences between number two and number three are a little bit tricky. We'll, we'll walk through these, but the first one's easy enough, right? The first one is known as the objective standard. Okay, who am I up to? Uh, oh, sorry, Kendra. Kendra, tell me, what is the objective standard for the claim of right? Well, what 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 was what was the, the it's in the reading, right? What's what's the objective standard? You have it? I'll come back to you. Megan? Um, like if a reasonable person in that position believed that the land or that they took the land, um Megan, with the objective standard, does the court consider the state of mind at all? Kendra? No, and the state of mind is irrelevant. There you go. Very good. With the objective standard, the state of mind is irrelevant. What does that mean? We don't ask what Mr. Robinson had in mind. We don't ask what the Lutzes had in mind. We don't ask why they built the staircase 15 inches over the property line. It doesn't matter. So long as the person asserts a claim of right, they just assert some interest in the property, that's it. Now, uh, Chelsea, we say there are four elements of adverse possession. With an objective standard, does the fourth element even matter? No. So with this objective standard, the fourth element basically becomes irrelevant, right? So long as I assert some interest in the property, that's it. It doesn't matter what my state of mind is, okay? This is a standard, they, they talk about the Connecticut standard, right? That was adopted in Manila, okay? With this Connecticut standard adopted in Manila, it doesn't really matter what your state of mind is. Why? Because the court doesn't care. If you're squatting there openly and notoriously for five years, it's yours. It doesn't really matter what your state of mind is. Make sense? That's the easiest one of the four to apply, of the three. 
The next one's a little bit trickier. It's called the good faith standard. Okay? Lauren, tell me please, what is the good faith standard? Bless you. Yeah. So, so Lauren, if you if you're claiming that you have a good faith claim to the land, what what what's in your mind? Right? What are you thinking? Well, I'm not just doing the right thing, but what what's your thinking about the ownership of the land? Yeah. The easy way to explain it. I thought I owned it. Right. I thought I owned it. Okay, maybe I was mistaken. You know, people make mistakes. Maybe I didn't have it for five years or three years, whatever else. My paperwork was bad, right? But I thought I owned it. So let me go back to Jolene's question a minute ago. Did Mr. Lutz have a good faith or was he hostile? He was hostile. But, oh, Jake's not here. But, but going back to Jake's question to the uh, as of class, right? If you, if you think you have this deed, that turns to be forged, it's like, look, I thought I owned it, I bought it in good faith, right? That's a little bit easier to satisfy, okay? But then we have the third standard, I think Jolene's right. The third standard is Mr. Rob, uh, is, uh, Mr. Lutz, right? It's called the aggressive trespasser standard. Uh, and, and Rachel, what's, tell me about this aggressive trespasser standard, please. Bingo. So let me summarize this, right? I know I don't own it, but I intend to make it mine. Right? It's like, yeah, I didn't buy it, but it's going to be mine. This is Mr. Robinson, without question. He said on TV, it's not mine, but it's going to be mine in a couple years. Uh, I think Jolene's right. I think Mr. Lust would probably fall in this category as well. He says, yeah, I never bought it, but it's mine because I've been on to keep my farm there, keep my business there, et cetera. Okay? This is the main doctrine, the Preble case. Right? This is the doctrine in Maine, which was the old common law standard, which, of course, um, New Jersey adopts. Uh, someone will ask me, what is the Texas standard? Do you really need to ask me? It's the hostile standard, right? You need to show hostility, which is why Mr. Robinson was making the entire you know, sort of claim he was. And and this is right here in the statute. If you, if you go back to the statute, it says, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, where is it? Oops. Still figuring out the kinks of this classroom. Okay, hostile, right? It says it right there in the definition to adverse possession. It has to be hostile to the claim of others. It has to be aggressive trespass. It's got to be hostile. It can't just be a mistake or good faith. you got to be hostile. Okay. So what the court says in the New Jersey case, which is shocking, right? You know, you know the answer, Eddie, is that we are abandoning the aggressive trespasser st standard, right? Joey, why, why does the New Jersey court abandon the aggressive trespasser statute or, or standard? They talked about the boundaries. No, that you're talking about the um, open notorious element. I'm talking about the claim of right. Why does a New Jersey court move away from the main doctrine and they adopt the Connecticut doctrine? Okay. You know, why is New Jersey abandoning the old common law standard? You should, you should be able to guess at this one by this point. Suffer through me for a semester. You got one more. How would the New Jersey judges describe the old main doctrine? What, what word would they say? Or they'll say it's not blank. I heard someone say it. What's that word? It's not blank. What's my least favorite word? 
the F word. Fair. It's not fair. Right? Why should you make someone act like a jerk to get adverse possession? Right? Why do you need to force one to be this hostile, aggressive trespasser? Okay, he made a mistake. Right? He thought it was his, it wasn't. Or he just didn't think about it. The Jersey court says we're not going to put this burden of requiring to be an absolute jerk. Right? Mr. Robinson was a lovely guy, but his state of mind was hostile. Why do we need such hostility? We don't care. So they adopt, they adopt the, New, the Connecticut standard, which says we're not going to care what the person's state of mind is. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Okay. So everyone get that much, right? And, and to the extent there's a modern trend, these things exist. The modern trend is going towards the objective or the good faith standard, right? Texas again, I think, still sticks with the old standard. That's that's what it usually does. So everyone okay with that, with the, with, the, with the claim of right standard? So if you're reading, you think, aha, they're going to win, right? The, st the guy with the stairs is going to win, but then they take a sharp turn. Daniel, how does the court then shock us all? They, they make up this new standard of, uh, of, of, of why this case got to be sent back down. Very good. Why is this possession not open and notorious, Daniel? Very good. What the court says here is that we have to construe this open notorious standard very strictly. Sure, he was 15 inches over. But the only way of knowing that is to conduct a survey. Uh, we'll do surveys later this semester, but that means you have an expert comes on board, measures the lines of the property. It's very complicated. It's actually very expensive. I had a survey done fairly recently. It's not cheap, right? I had a survey done for a townhouse. There's no, there's, the boundaries are where they are. But you know, I had to, I had to get that done. Um, if it requires a survey to notice it, it's not notorious and open. So the effect of this is, right? The effect of this, Michelle, if it requires a survey to figure out if this trespass is happening and there's no survey done, is the open and notorious element satisfied? No, no it's not. So did the clock ever actually start ticking for these 15 inches of stairs? Mm -hmm. So what would have to end up happening after this case sets back to the lower court? Um, yeah, okay. Say it. Like, Not just a survey. What if they show that, you know, we had no idea that 15 inches was there? What do they have to do to the stairs? Sorry? Measure. Not just measure it. Are the stairs there legally? So what do you have to do to the stairs? Remove them. You gotta take them out. Right, just think about that for a minute, right? Those stairs have been there for, for a number of years. But because it wasn't open and notorious, they have not gained adverse possession. Therefore, the stairs are a trespass. And when you have a trespass, you have to get rid of it. It means you chop up the stairs. Now, that's not what happened, Zach. What actually happened at the end of this case? Had, had, they, had, had they worked stuff out? Uh, I'm not sure. It says in the end, you have it? Mm -hmm. You paid um, $250 <laughs> for those stairs. Yeah. I mean, why do people do this? They appealed the case all the way up to the New Jersey Supreme Court for 15 inches of soil that was worth what? $250. So it was only what? You know, the, couple decades ago, it wasn't that much money, right? However much lawyers bill, they build more than 250 bucks. So anyway, this entire case was stupid, right? They could have resolved this thing in five seconds. Say, oh, okay, well, yeah, you know what? 15 inches, fine. I'll sell you that property, whatever that 15 inch square is, for $250. No. Go to the lawyers, chop up your steps. It's insane. So this case proves, once again, lawyers are usually the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Uh, <laughs> But here again, they solved it amicably. OK? All right. So any questions about the second case? All right, let me, let me wrap up a bit. Um, you have to know these four factors cold. Uh, the first three are not very difficult. The fourth factor um, does fluctuate based on the jurisdiction. 
So on the midterm or whatever, make sure you pay attention to what jurisdiction you're in, and it will tell you what standard you are applying in terms of the state of mind with the, with the claim of right. Um, in our next class, we'll be doing some fairly tricky mechanical issues. What do they mean by that? What if person A starts squatting for five years and then person B squats for another five years? You put those two squats together. It's a little tricky. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Anything in your minds? All right. I'll see you on Wednesday. Well, good to be back. Thank you.